Captain's Log, Stardate, KB Lake release is upon us. We're looking at the Z270 chipset to go along with the new KB Lake desktop processors. I'm gonna make a log entry regarding the ASRock Fatality Z270 Gaming K6. You could beam down some support. Primitive Captain. Oh, what's gotten into me? I just don't even know. So we're gonna take a look at the ASRock Fatality Z270 Gaming K6. Overall, it is, you know, a four slot DDR4 board. It does support up to 3866, although that's a single slot. Uh, I don't have any memory that fast to test it with, but with the G-Skill memory that I have, it worked great out of the box, DDR4 3200. Uh, even with all four sticks, worked fine. That's a 32 gigabyte configuration with this. This is Intel Optane ready. Now, the big difference with Z270 is that the DMI has four extra PCI Express lanes for peripherals, Thunderbolt connections, whatever. Um, the back panel connections on this implement an ASMedia USB 3.1 with one Type-A and one Type-C. Let's take a closer look at the ports along the back. At the top of the motherboard, we can see that we've got our first M.2 slot. Now this is an E key, which is designed for wireless adapters, Bluetooth adapters, combo adapters, that sort of thing. And then you've got two cutouts on the back panel for your wireless solution. This motherboard can be ordered with a built-in wireless solution. You got a PS2 mouse and keyboard, two USB 3 ports, VGA and DVI, and one HDMI. Uh, you've got two Intel NICs, one i219 and one i211. You've also got your ASMedia USB 3.1 solution with one Type A port and one Type C port, as I was mentioning before. Two more USB 3.0 ports, and then below that you've got your inbuilt audio solution, which is based around that Realtek ALC 1220, but it's a Sound Blaster Cinema 3 solution. Now, what about our PCI Express layout? Well, you've got three physical by 16 slots and three physical by one slots. This can be a by 16 for your graphics card or a by eight by eight configuration or by eight by eight by four. So it does support three-way crossfire and NVIDIA SLI. It also comes with a high-speed bridge. So you can do the quad SLI thing if you wanna do that with two NVIDIA graphics cards on KB Lake. You can also see that there are two more M.2 ports. Now the M.2 layout on this board is pretty intelligent. The M.2 is going to have ample room to breathe, regardless of where you put it, unless you're in a dual graphics configuration. But if you're in a dual graphics configuration, you can always use the, the M.2 above the first graphics card. That, that M.2 is going to have the best breathability. But the second M.2 is just below the second PCI Express by 16 slot. So if you're running two graphics cards or two cards that would produce a lot of heat, the second M.2 may not get as much cooling but it's moved to the very front of the board to give it the best shot at cooling. So if you do have front cooling in your case, even though the M.2 may be covered by the graphics card, you're gonna get that fresh air intake from the front of the case. At the bottom edge of the motherboard, you've got your HD audio solution. Now this is on an isolated part of the PCB for noise reduction, noise cancellation. So hopefully you don't pick up too much digital noise on the analog circuit for the, the uh, sound card. Then you've got your jumper, which is for resetting the CMOS. Then you've got an on off switch for your XMP profile. So if you wanna set your XMP profile by just turning the switch on, this will tell the motherboard to automatically use the XMP overclock profile of your memory. So if you, you know, like the DDR3200 memory, when you plug it in, it runs at 2133 until you tell it you wanna use the extreme memory profile and then it'll run at 3200. Well, you can just throw the switch and the motherboard will try to use 3200 right out the gate. Then you've got your RGB header connector. So this will use standard RGB header strips. You get your two Thunderbolt connections. So if you're gonna use Thunderbolt with this motherboard, you will need an add-in card. You can put that in the bottom slot and it's also gonna plug into these motherboard headers. And then you've got your three USB 2.0 headers for internal peripherals or if you wanna break it out into more USB 2.0 ports. You get your TPM header, you got your RS-232 header. You got a four pin fan header, which you can control through the UEFI. And then you've got your front panel connections. Just above that at the front of the motherboard, you've got your M.2 slot. This one supports uh, M.2s up to 110 millimeters in length. Then you've got your eight SATA ports. You got two USB 3.0 ports, another fan header, your 24 pin ATX power connector. Then you've got your reset and power buttons at the top edge of the board. Just behind your four DDR4 RAM slots, uh, you've got your two CPU fan headers, one of which is for the CPU optional fan in case you're doing a push pull configuration or a water pump. And then of course you've got your eight pin power connector and then tucked behind the eight pin power connector is that M.2 that I was mentioning before. Now one thing to note with this motherboard with the three PCI Express by one slots, the back of the slots are open, so you can use PCI Express peripherals that are not necessarily by one. You could use a by two card, such as a network interface card, or a by four card, such as a capture card. However, your PCI Express bandwidth will be limited to just the PCI Express by one interface. If you need PCI Express by four or three or two, 
you'll have to use the bottom slot for that. Now the bottom slot and of course the M.2 uh, do support NVMe booting and, and all of that. These two M.2 slots are both SATA, SATA 6 gigabit per second, as well as PCI Express, thanks to the Z270 chipset. And the PS2 port is great if you're a crazy person like me, still running an IBM Model M with a PS2 interface. Yeah, it's not in-key rollover unless you got my mods, but it's pretty good. There's one other fan header that I didn't mention, which is just above the first PCI Express by one expansion slot. All right, we are in the UEFI of our Z270 Gaming K6. Now this is a very, very early UEFI, so things may change, as it were. This is the basic setup screen. Uh, you can go to the tools section and update the UEFI from the internet. You can do the internet flash thing and it'll initialize your internet connection maybe and then maybe you'll be able to download the flash. Hey, we've got an update. Look at that. So you just arrow over to update and hit enter and it'll download and update the firmware. You just hit enter to reboot the system and you're good to go. And we're back in UEFI after it's been updated. All right, so let's go into advanced mode F6 and take a look at our full settings. So we've got, you can see that it's detected the memory, 16 gigabytes of RAM, that's our crucial. You can see that it detects our i5 7600K at 3.8 gigahertz, six megs of cache. Confirm that we've got the AVX ratio setting so that we can enter a negative value here. Uh, this is helpful for overclocks because if you recall from Skylake, um, sometimes we would disable the AVX instruction set altogether because when doing AVX testing with a high overclock, the system would crash. This will let you set a negative multiplier so that the AVX part of the CPU runs slower even with a higher overclock, which is a nice feature. I wonder why speed shift is disabled by default. This does give us the per core uh, overclock control so we can set you know, one core, two core, three cores, and four cores for what the overclock ratio will be. Here we see that we can disable some of our processor cores, enable C states for power management, enable or disable CPU thermal throttling technology, virtualization, other hardware features. This is the DRAM screen. Uh, the Intel management firmware. ME firmware version 11.6.0.1126. Good to know. VTD is enabled. This is going to be important if you use hardware pass-through, hardware virtualization. If you intend to use the onboard uh, GPU as well as an add-in GPU, you'll want to enable this so that you can have maximum multi-monitor support. Here you see we can control both of our onboard Ethernet controllers, onboard front panel audio, the WAN, deep sleep power options, and some other advanced options. Under SATA mode selection, we can see that we can pick between AHCI and Intel RST, that's rapid storage technology with Optane system acceleration support. We can also control the add-in as media controller, which gives us some extra SATA ports. And we can see how our SATA devices are detected down here. Thunderbolt is possible through an add-in card, through the add-in header, but it's fully disabled in this configuration. So we get PS2 and RS-232 support under the Super I.O. configuration. And then ACPI gives us some options to uh, have the system wake up if, you know, a PS2 peripheral wakes up or, you know, the LAN or, you know, RTC alarm or USB keyboard or PS2 keyboard or whatever. XHCI handoff can be useful if your operating system doesn't properly support USB 3 or you're going through a, an installation where USB 3 is not supported by the operating system installer. You can turn this on and you may be able to get past um, the operating system installer not being able to detect its installation USB drive or something like that. You can turn that on here. I also like that the UEFI gives you control for enabling and disabling USB ports. You see this a lot on business class machines, but you don't really see it very much on DIY machines where you can individually control each USB port. Some businesses like to do that to prevent people from, you know, using flash drives, but still maintaining USB compatibility or USB functionality for USB peripherals. You can also set if you want to go by default into this more advanced view or if you want to start out on the easy mode. UEFI screen, that sort of thing. It's pretty standard, really. This UEFI does feature a system browser where you can browse the uh, system and see what peripherals are installed. We don't have very much installed right now, so it doesn't show very much. But you can, you know, select an individual item and see more details about that for add-in cards or NVMe that you may have installed or USB peripherals or whatever is installed on the back panel. It's really handy. UEFI Tech Service lets you file an incident with ASRock technical support directly from the UEFI. Uh, you can set your name and phone number and email and uh, you know attach some information about your issue and it'll send your UEFI configuration which greatly expedites the uh, troubleshooting process. The Easy RAID installer and e Easy Driver installer will help you configure a USB stick that contains like the Windows operating system with drivers necessary for Intel RST and, and that sort of thing. 
And then of course you've got instant flash, internet flash, and secure backup for the UEFI. It'll, you can copy the UEFI from one chip to another chip uh, because there's a backup chip on the motherboard. And then you can go into your uh, internet configuration and set it up for something other than DHCP if your network doesn't have a DHCP server or you just want to manually configure it. You can also configure the uh, UEFI download server for the global region that you're in. Under the hardware monitor you can see all the hardware parameters. You can also go into fantastic tuning. <laughs> I love that name and set the profiles that you want for your fans and, and how they respond. It's kind of nice that it's in the UEFI. You don't have to rely on operating system support for that. You can set the CPU opt header to behave as a CPU optional header fan or water pump control. Water pump control is just, you know, full on or full off. Chassis 3 fan can also be a water pump if you would like for it to be. You can set the mode here to be water pump mode and then you'll have the same sorts of controls as you do from the CPU optional header. There's also over temperature protection here which is a sensor based on the motherboard uh, for control of over temperature versus CPU thermal throttling so it's a little different thing but this will shut down the system when the temperature is uh, detected as overheated. You get your standard fair security options and including the secure boot and Intel uh, platform trust options. If you're going to use Secure Boot, go ahead and enable it before you install Windows or Linux, as the case may be. And then you get your standard issue boot options, where you can configure, you know, the operating system that you want to boot from, your boot manager, that sort of thing. And that's been a quick tour of the Asrock Fatality Gaming K6 Z270 based motherboard. Hopefully, this uh, tour of the UEFI was insightful and you found everything you were looking for. Now, in testing with this motherboard. Um, you know, I've only got the one i5 CPU to test this with, so I have not had a chance to really put it through its paces, really see what it's got in terms of overclockability, in terms of power delivery, in terms of heat dissipation. But for the modest overclocking that I did, getting the i5 to about 4.5 gigahertz, it did really well. The VRM really didn't get very hot at all. Uh, KB Lake in general, had, like all the power management stuff and it's like all the efficiency to, of Skylake, really pretty much gone. The, the, the gains, the performance gains with KB Lake, really not that much. Most of the gains with KB Lake are around the peripheral I.O. So you can run more PCI Express lanes for your peripherals, things like more M.2 or more Thunderbolt, that sort of thing. The processor itself is really not, not anything dramatic in terms of an upgrade over Skylake. Uh, it actually uses a lot more power and generates a lot more heat than Skylake, but for that extra power and heat, you get a tiny, tiny little bit more performance and maybe a little bit more overclockability, although the jury is still out on that. But overall, I did not have any problems with this board. It does have a numeric diagnostic readout, so you can look in the manual if something's not booting or you can't find anything, which will help you pin down, you know, if your computer won't post or you've got problems, maybe you've got misseated RAM or something like that, you'll get a numeric code on the readout that'll help you troubleshoot. Overall, it's a pretty competent board for Z270. Uh, it's a little different, it's a little different color scheme. I think the board is maybe aimed at gamers or aimed at people that want a red and black color scheme for their motherboard. But overall, I found it to be a pretty competent motherboard. There were some subtle differences in the UEFI, but if there's this, you know, a huge swath of features or a huge you know, set of tweaks that I missed, let us know in the comments and I'll add it to the description. Now, I didn't have a chance to try this motherboard with Linux, but the Extreme 4 Z270, also from ASRock, worked perfectly with Linux out of the box. Uh, sound the whole nine yards. So I would expect this one to work perfectly out of the box as well, given that the hardware is so similar. But if that's not the case, or you know, if somebody runs into problems, let us know in the comments and I'll be glad to do some additional testing. Maybe once all the KB Lake hoopla is out of the way, I can circle back to this motherboard and we can try some PCI pass through, something like that. All depends on you guys, whatever you want. I don't know, and whatever we got time for. So overall, it's pretty good. If you picked up one of these, let us know what your experiences are in the comments at level one text. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.